NASA uses scientific analysis to reveal the mysteries of the cosmos, our galaxy, the solar system, and our home planet Earth. Scientific analysis recently revealed another mystery, a third grader. <laughs> you can tell from the mustard and ketchup stains on his shirt, but it was a third grader who within the last several years asked me one of the most penetrating and intriguing questions I have gotten. Let me tell you the story. I was invited to speak at an Astronomical Society meeting in Spokane, Washington, and they invited me to come talk about the Kepler mission. And basically, the Kepler mission is trying to determine is there another Earth in our galaxy? And if so, how many? How rare or how common is this planet? While I was there, I was asked to go speak to an elementary school too, and I will never turn that opportunity down. I went to the elementary school, and there were 300 of these little creatures <laughs> sit, sitting on this gymnasium room floor, and I walked in and launched into my presentation about Kepler. Kids love space. They always want to talk to you about space aliens, starships, everything that has to do with space. And after I got through explaining Kepler and what we're trying to do, I took questions, as I always do in these sessions. And I got to this one little kid, and he had this look of worry and concern on his face. And he says, why are we looking for another Earth? Do we need a backup? <laughs> Stopped me in my tracks. I did not know how to answer him, but I, I want to talk to you. <laughs> Well, this question of other Earths has been around for over 2,000 years. This is what Epicurus, that old Greek philosopher, had to say. There are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours. We must believe that in all worlds there are living creatures and plants and other living things we see in this world. NASA Astrophysics just released a roadmap with these three defining questions, and it is an amazing roadmap. We are tackling these questions over the next 30 years. Are we alone? How did we get here? How does the universe work? In fact, there's an amazing assertion in this roadmap that says this. The coming decades will see giant strides forward in finding Earth-like habitable worlds. The generation in this audience today, represented by the college students and those coming behind us, are going to be the first generation to confirm a life-bearing planet beyond our solar system. That will be an existential moment in human history. I want to tell you how we get there. I want to start with this instrument. This is the Kepler telescope. This is what I've been managing for the last five years. This is the largest telescope that NASA has ever launched beyond Earth orbit. It is over 55 million miles away from us today. And this is the camera that is on board that telescope. This is the business end of the telescope. This is what looks for planets. This instrument is amazing. There are 95 million pixels in this camera. If this telescope with this camera were still in low Earth orbit today, and we were looking at the moon, and there was an astronaut on the moon, and he had a flashlight, we could tell you if the flashlight was on or off. That's how precise the instrument is. This is how it works. We use something called transit photometry. We stare at the stars and we wait for the planet to go across the face of the star. When it does it several times, we can provide or, dis or discern important information from that. We can tell you the size of the planet, how far away it is from its star and its orbital period. If you were standing on the edge of our solar system and you see the Earth do this once a year, and it would take the Earth about 12 hours to go across the face of our sun. And we did this by staring at 155,000 stars simultaneously. But what we're looking for is very specific. We're looking for planets that are in the so-called habitable zone, that area that we sometimes refer to as the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, <laughs> it's just right. Water can pool on the surface of the planet. And as we know, on this planet, water is vital for life. Let's talk about where we're looking. Everybody take your hand and hold it up against the sky. That's the size of Kepler's field of view. You can put your hands down. 
and we're looking through this area called the Cygnus and Lyra constellation. That field of view is huge compared to other fields of view. Thousands of times bigger than Hubble, thousands of times bigger than any ground-based telescope, but we needed a large field of view because of the science that we're doing. Here's a closer look at it. There are four and a half million stars in Kepler's field of view, not counting the galaxies that are hundreds of millions of light years away from us. And we selected only 155,000 stars to monitor. That was the limit of our technology. The three yellow dots you see are the known planets in Kepler's field of view before we launched, and we launched in March of 2009. What have we found in four years? Over 3,800 planets, and we only see the ones that transit. This is an amazing discovery. Kepler is rewriting the astronomical textbooks. But what does it mean when you take the Kepler results and you extend them across the cosmos? Only our galaxy alone. This is what Kepler tells us. There are more planets than stars. If there are 200 billion planets in our galaxy, there are many more billions of planets than the stars. And what more interestingly is this number. One out of every five stars harbors an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. If there's 200 billion stars in our galaxy, there are 40 billion Earth-like planets. This is an astonishing number. I want you to let that sink in and think about the potential impact to understand the extent of life across this galaxy. But we cannot tell you if the planets that Kepler has found are indeed habitable. We can tell you they're in the right zone. But this is where the roadmap comes in. The next 30 years, this is what we're doing. You can see Kepler there at the beginning of this roadmap, and this stretches out for the next 30 years. James Webb Space Telescope launches in about four years. It will make Hubble like a little child. It is a telescope on hormone. <laughs> And then comes the two interesting missions. L-U-V-O-I-R, NASA loves acronyms. That stands for Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Telescope. This is for the first time we will penetrate the atmospheres of these planets and understand what is in the atmospheres. What are the volatiles? Is there oxygen? Is there nitrogen? Is there carbon dioxide? Is there methane? Is there water vapor? Good indicators of life. And finally, when we get to ExoMapper, we're going to do something that is going to be remarkable. We are going to image the surface of another planet beyond our solar system. We will be able to discern the contours of the surface of the planets. We will be able to see land formations, ocean formations, perhaps ice caps, perhaps large cloud formations, and more importantly, something of a biological signature, something like a vegetation canopy. That is going to be a red letter day. And eventually, we want to see something kind of like this. This is a real planet, but this is an artist's concept of the planet. This was Kepler 62F. This is the closest thing we've found so far that comes to something like Earth. This planet is 1,200 light years away from us. It is about 1.4 times the size of Earth. There are four other planets in this system with it. And this one is in the habitable zone. We also believe it is a rocky planet. It is orbiting a star only slightly smaller and cooler than our own. But this is an amazing discovery. There's another planet in this system too called 62E. It's also in the habitable zone. The habitable zone planets are coming out of the Kepler data now as we speak, more and more. I want to show you a photograph of my favorite planet. Last year, Cassini was orbiting Saturn. We told the spacecraft, look over your shoulder and take that photograph. And I'm not talking about Saturn as my favorite planet. I'm talking about that little pixel of light you see in the lower right-hand corner. That's Earth from a billion miles away. Did you know we live on a pixel of light? but that's what it looks like from a billion miles. And I've been talking about a roadmap that takes us 30 years out. Where 
will that pixel of light, that little planet, be in 30 years? Here's what the forecasters and prognosticators say. We are at 7.1 billion people on this planet today. 30 years from now, we're going to be at 9.2 billion. Requirements for energy generation are going to go up. Energy consumption is going to go up. Because we remain addicted to fossilized fuels, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere will increase. Acidification of the ocean is expected to increase as well, and deforestation is likely to increase. We need big ideas to address that. If you go to the internet and you Google most iconic photographs of the 20th century, there are two that are important that I want to share with you. This is the first one. This is Robert Goddard, considered by many to be the father of modern rocketry. And the reason I want to talk about him is because he had big ideas. This man has 214 patents to his name. He also has the patent for the multi-stage liquid fuel rocket, which we eventually used to get to the moon. In 1919 and 1920, he also wrote about a big idea. He thought then he could actually build a rocket to go to the moon, and he believed he could prove it. He was skewered in the press across the United States. In fact, there was an opinion editorial written in the New York Times making fun of him. And this criticism went on and on and on. Finally, a reporter quizzed him one day, Mr. Goddard, when are you going to respond to all this criticism? And he finally said, OK, I will. He said, this is my answer to all the criticism. Every vision is a joke until the first man does it, and then it becomes commonplace. There's one that I want to share with you. And this one gives me chill bumps every time I look at it. This is Earthrise from the moon. This was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts in December of 1968. When they were coming around the backside of the moon, they actually had black and white film loaded in the camera. And then they saw this vision. They took the black and white film out and put it in color because it was so beautiful to them. It was John F. Kennedy who set us on this path to make this happen. Many people can still consider the moon landings as the crowning technological achievement for humankind. I want you to think about the environment, though, that what Kennedy was facing when he made the speech in September of 1962, which put us on that path. He said, we do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Big ideas always are hard. He faced an amazing world he had to face down the Soviet Union, who was criticized for not being able to handle Nikita Khrushchev very well. He had just come out of the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was a fiasco for his administration. He was also trying to get civil rights and voting rights started in Congress, and he was being resisted on that as well. He understood that environment. And he was going to talk about it in a speech in November 22, 1963. In a world of complex and continuing problems, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason. He did not get to speak those words because he was killed that day. Where does that leave our third grader? I do not know, nor do any of us in this room know, what his iconic photographs of the 21st century will be. He will be part of a generation, though, that does confirm a life-bearing planet beyond our solar system. He has so many challenges ahead of him, and we're dumping a lot of poo at his doorstep. But there is hope. And let me tell you what that hope is. He faces two major enemies, two major enemies, ignorance and apathy. As long as we instill our children with a lifelong thirst for knowledge, and we realize that education is less expensive than ignorance, we will succeed and we will get there. We must also instill our children with a value system in which they value their home. I'm not talking about the house they live in. I'm talking about this world that we all share and live in and we value everybody who's on it. As long as we do that, one day, he will look out on that cosmos, and they will be able to point out the stars where there are planets that harbor life. And if we humans ever go to those worlds, if we ever go to those worlds, 
those descendants will look back over their shoulder and they will see that tiny little light in the distance and they will say that's home that is the first earth and it is still the home of big ideas thank you georgia